research, and he will focus on basically a continuation of his keynote address from last year, which was also called. Well, I'm sorry, that, but he will focus on bio oil upgrading using platinum catalysts. Sorry for that, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, the um, there are additional uh, research groups involved in this um, presentation. That is. Um, the Biosystems and Agricultural uh, Engineering at the University of Kentucky and Fuels, Engines and Emissions Research Center at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Please help me welcome Mark. Thank you, Rishi. So today I'd like to say a few words about some very recent activities uh, concerning bio oil upgrading. And I realize that I'm or is standing between you and coffee, so I'll try not to detain you for too long. Well, biomass can be converted into fuels and chemicals by a variety of processes. Fermentation is an obvious example that has been much in the news lately. But additionally, there are direct thermochemical conversion processes, which can be broadly grouped into three categories, namely fast pyrolysis, high pressure liquefaction, and also solvolysis the latter also being referred to as hydrothermal upgrading. And of these processes, uh, pyrolysis is generally considered to be the most promising and is the closest to commercialization. And indeed, there are a number of fairly large pilot units in operation in several countries. Now, in fast, pyro in fast pyrolysis, biomass is uh, converted by heating at around about 550 degrees C in the absence of oxygen. Contact times are kept very short, in the order of about one to two seconds. And the product is a vapor, which can be condensed to a crude bio oil. Additionally, gases are also formed. Typically, these would be combusted to provide heat for the process. And the other main product is a, a solid named char. So having made these crude bio oils, what can you do with them? Well, Co-firing is one obvious example, e.g. co-firing with coal to produce electricity. Another, another would be gasification, followed by conversion to transportation fuels using Fischer-Tropsch technology. A third alternative is catalytic upgrading to fuels and chemicals. And this may or may not be preceded by an extraction step to isolate the most valuable oxygenates present, such as levoglucosan and hydroxyacid aldehyde. And again, the residual bio oil would then be catalytically upgraded. Unfortunately, the upgrading of crude bio oils is not without its difficulties. And this stems from the fact that these crude bio oils possess a number of rather undesirable characteristics. Uh, these include a high oxygen content, typically around about 40 weight percent on a dry basis, high water content, typically low heating values, and also they're rather corrosive due to the presence of carboxylic acids. Chemically, they're extremely complex. Over 400 different compounds have been identified in fast pyrolysis oil. And most seriously, they're unstable. That's to say their viscosity increases upon standing or upon heating due to the occurrence of polymerization reactions, which can convert the oil into an extremely viscous material or even to a solid. So consequently, the oil requires an upgrading step to a stable product before it can subsequently be refined using conventional refining technology. Well, what are these various uh, compounds present in crude bio oils? Naturally, they're derived from the three main constituents of biomass, which comprise lignin, cellulose, and hemicellulose. I haven't included the structure of uh, hemicellulose on the slide because it's essentially amorphous in character, but it consists of uh, a polymer of pentoses and hexoses. In comparison with cellulose, it has a rather low molecular weight, typically co corresponding to about 200 sugar units. And when one pyrolyzes cellulose or hemicellulose, the principal products are uh, low molecular weight compounds, uh, which are isolated as gases, there are also light oxygenates present. So think here, methanol, acetic acid, hydroxyacetone, hydroxy aldehyde, hydroxyacetone, etc., and also furans. And in the case of lignin, obviously, the main products formed can be grouped into uh, heteroaromatics, 
and these result principally from cleavage of the ether linkages present in the ligand. Now, if you look in the literature, then it's clear that two main methods have been researched to date for the upgrading of crude biowells. And these can be divided into hydrotreating and acid cracking. In hydrotreating, use is made of fairly conventional hydrotreating technology, and it's quite effective in hydrogenating the unsaturated groups present and eliminating oxygen predominantly as water. And although it does work, unfortunately the economics are rather unfavorable due to the high hydrogen pressures required. For this reason, acid cracking has also attracted considerable attention uh, using solid acid catalysts such as CSM5. Again, this is effective, however, it does suffer from several disadvantages, namely the fact that the catalyst tends to undergo rapid deactivation due to coking, and so has to be continuously regenerated. Additionally, there's a tendency to form light, relatively, um, light products of relatively low value, resulting from, in essence, an over-cracking of the bioil. Well, with this in mind, we set about thinking of alternative uh, technologies, which might be uh, applicable. And we started with the observation um, that many workers have recently reported the steam reforming of oxygenates, such as alcohols and carboxylic acids, with a view to the production of hydrogen. And it's generally found that supported platinum and rhodium catalysts are the most active and durable for this type of application. Additionally, uh, Dumesic and co-workers have recently reported the aqueous phase reforming of oxygenates, such as glycerol and ethylene glycol, again over supported metal catalysts. And it's found that product selectivity is controlled by the relative rates of carbon-oxygen and carbon-carbon bond cleavage. Hence, platinum catalysts, which typically are the most active for carbon-carbon bond cleavage, tend to get tend to be the most active and selective catalysts for hydrogen pr production. In contrast, rhodium catalysts tend to favor carbon-oxygen bond cleavage, and so they're the most selective for the production of alkanes, particularly when acidic supports are used, which can contribute towards carbon-oxygen bond breaking. So our approach was to make use of liquid phase reforming using supported rhodium and platinum catalysts and uh, our strategy here was really to use very mild conditions, which we hoped with selection of the optimum of, of an appropriate catalyst would be uh, an optimum for cleaving carbon-oxygen bonds as opposed to cleaving carbon-carbon bonds. And in so doing, we would be able to deoxygenate our bioil. So our approach was to perform catalyst screening studies. And to do this, we made use of a model bioil. Now we did this as opposed to using a real fast pyrolysis oil for two main reasons. First of all, fast pyrolysis oils are extremely complex, as I said, so it's very difficult to track the fate of individual compounds present. And secondly, the composition of fast pyrolysis oils tends to be rather variable from batch to batch. And that's obviously would cause uh, considerable problems in this type of study. So we made use of our model oil, which consists of a mixture of 10 components, uh, which are really representative of the most reactive functional groups typically present in pyrolysis oils. And here you see some of the components, of the structures of which you may be a little less familiar with than uh, in some others. I should also mention that uh, subsequent studies have uh, been conducted using a fast pyrolysis oil. However, those studies are ongoing, so I'm not going to talk about them today. So here you see in detail the composition of our model bio-oil. Essentially what we have here are a series of oxygenates, which would be typical uh, decomposition products obtained from cellulose and hemicellulose. And additionally, we have two aromatic compounds, which would be typical degradation products obtained from lignin. In total, the organics comprise 80 weight percent of the oil, and additionally we have 20 weight percent water present. The reactions were performed in a stirred autoclave at 350 degrees C. Uh, before each run, the uh, reactor was flushed with nitrogen, and then it was operated under autogenous pressure. In addition to obtaining liquids, we also make gases and solids, and these were analyzed using the, the methods shown. Here you see a photo of a, a typical upgraded oil. You can see that we have a, a reasonably mobile oil phase, 
And additionally, there's a separate aqueous phase. So here are some results for experiments performed using a series of supported platinum catalysts. And what I'm doing here is plotting the weight percent of oxygen in the upgraded oil for the different catalysts tested. You can see that in our initial oil, we have about 44 weight percent oxygen present. And for our best catalyst, which is platinum on alumina, we have a final oxygen content of around 5 weight percent. So clearly these platinum catalysts are fairly uh, efficient. I should mention that in all cases we were using a platinum loading of 1 weight percent. <coughs> well, whilst platinum catalysts were found to afford relatively mobile oil phases, in contrast, rhodium catalysts, somewhat to our surprise, gave mainly a solid product. And this was found to consist of a mixture of char and a heavy oil. And since we were really interested in uh, forming liquid products, we've uh, concentrated the rest of the work on the platinum catalysts. We should also emphasize that we do form solids and gases as products using these platinum catalysts. Here you can see the composition of our initial uh, oil containing 32 weight percent, of, uh, sorry, in this case 32 grams of organics and uh, 8 grams of water, so we have a total charge of 40 grams. And for our platinum on alumina catalyst, which you may recall is the best catalyst, we have an oil yield of roughly 6 grams. Now I should point out that the theoretical maximum oil yield, assuming that oxygen is rejected as CO2, is 12.5 grams. So we're at about half the maximum theoretical yield of oil. But you'll also notice that our mass balances are far from stellar. Typically, we're at around about 80 to 85 percent. And the reason for this is that uh, at the end of the reaction, naturally enough, we have to separate the oil and the water phases from the solids present. And during the separation, we do lose a certain amount of the aqueous and oil phases. So that's why our, our mass balances aren't particularly good, and why, in some cases, our yields of oil and uh, aqueous phases also are particularly good. With respect to the composition of the gases formed, uh, it turns out that uh, most of the catalysts give a fairly uh, uniform uh, composition. If, for example, we look at the platinum or alumina, you'll see that hydrogen and methane are being generated. There's no CO present, which is perhaps not too surprising. These are all fairly good low temperature shift catalysts. So if we were rejecting oxygen and CO, it would presumably be shifted to a hydrogen and CO2. CO2 is, of course, the major product formed, as expected. And additionally, we form small amounts of alkanes in the C2 to C6 range, although these yields are really very modest. What would these oils look like if we were to distill them? Well, we perform simulated distillation chromatography. You can see that for our initial oil, we have components boiling in the naphtha and kerosene ranges. And upon upgrading, we obtain, again, fairly light oils. So we have the naphtha and kerosene components as the dominant um, components present. Additionally, we do form some um, species which are boiling in the distillate and heavy gas oil ranges. Nonetheless, one would characterize these as light oils. Given that the platinum and alumina catalyst was the, the most promising, we performed a number of additional experiments. This just shows you that the repeatability of the experiments was, generally speaking, good. If one increases the reaction time from two hours to four hours, then one can actually further decrease the oxygen content of the upgraded oil down to a value of about three weight percent. So this from 44% for initial oil. We also performed some runs without water present. And you can see that when we do this, the uh, residual oxygen content is actually higher. So clearly, the presence of excess water is beneficial for the upgrading. And this uh, implicates the occurrence of uh, reforming reactions. We also have to contend with thermal reactions which are occurring, specifically thermal cracking. This shows you the results of GCMS analysis on an upgraded oil which was uh, performed without any catalyst present. So we're using our standard uh, conditions and we're only observing the occurrence of thermal reactions here. You can see that uh, we do have some of our starting materials present, mainly guiacol. We also have vanillin here, though it's apparent that most of our vanillin has reacted. 
and we observe principally alkylated phenols and cresols as the reaction products, uh, and additionally benzene diol. So it's clear that there's quite a lot of thermal chemistry occurring here in the form of alkylation, dealkylation reactions, disproportion, disproportionation, and also hydrolysis. I should mention that there was also a separate aqueous phase obtained, which contains some of the light oxygenates in the starting oil, as well as certain uh, phenolic products. So what does the upgraded oil look like? Well, again, here you see the GCMS analysis for the oil obtained with the platinum or alumina catalyst. And now we have mainly non-heteroatom aromatics as a product. It's also apparent that there is a certain degree of hydrogenation of the aromatic ring occurring. So for example, we have ethyl benzene here. We also have ethyl cyclohexane. Here we have biphenyl. We also have cyclohexyl benzene resulting from hydrogenation of one of the aromatic rings in the biphenyl. Additionally, we do have some oxygenates. These are mainly alkylated phenols, as, as in the case of two methyl phenols. Here I've summarized some of the thermal and catalyzed reactions that we think are occurring. These would include decarbonylation of the vanillin to afford Guiacol. It's clear that alkylation reactions are also occurring, possibly also disproportionation, which is a, a well-known reaction for aromatics uh, at high temperatures. Also hydrolysis, which in the case of Guiacol would afford the observed benzene diol. And then as far as catalyzed reactions are concerned, an obvious candidate is hydrogenolysis, uh, which in the case of Guiacol would afford phenol, and of course this might react further to afford benzene, and of course hydrogenation to afford cyclohexanes. So to conclude, we found that platinum catalyst shows significant activity for the deoxygenation of a model bio-oil. Oxygen appears to be rejected principally as CO2, but presumably also as water and hydrogen is formed via reforming, although possibly also via the water gas shift reaction. And using platinum on alumina, it's possible to achieve very deep deoxygenation levels. That's to say, uh, over 90% of the oxygen can be removed. The principal products are alkylated aromatics, and simulated distillation shows that the oil products uh, can be classified as light oils. And on this slide, I've attempted to put these various ob observations together in a simplified reaction scheme. What we think is happening is that the light oxygenates are being principally reformed to, to hydrogen and CO2. Now, presumably, some CO bond is also occurring because we do observe the formation of alkanes, albeit in modest yield. So reforming really appears to be the dominant pathway. And this will be expected, bearing in mind that we're using platinum catalysts. In the case of the aromatics, reforming is obviously going to be thermodynamically disfavored, and so carbon-oxygen bond cleavage dominates. And in the presence of the hydrogen generated here, we obtain benzenes, which can be further hydrogenated to cyclohexanes. So in essence, what we're doing here is we're forming hydrogen by the in-situ reforming of the light oxygenates, and then we're using this hydrogen for the upgrading of the aromatics, which are the most valuable components present. So with that, it just remains for me to acknowledge the assistance of Dr. Yayin Ji for the uh, catalyst preparations. Uh, Professor Robert Brown of Iowa State University has been kind enough to supply us with some fast pyrolysis oils, which we're currently using in these studies. And funding was provided by the, rural, uh, the Kentucky Rural Energy Consortium. And thank you for your attention. Because in case of hydrocracking, this reaction actually exothermic, uh, which is moderate exothermic, and plus we can actually suppress fog formation and increase the uh, possible uh, uh, duration of your. Right. Um, well, under hydro treating, um, 
hydrocracking was also full. So I mean, people have looked at different uh, options as far as hydrotreating is concerned over sort of typical um, sulfide sulfide catalysts as well as sort of typical hydrocracking catalysts. Um, yeah, it does work, but again, um, you need fairly significant amounts of hydrogen and uh, overall. But you don't need pressure. No. Um, but the overall economics are rather unfavorable. It's not fun to Any other questions? I might actually have one. Um, there were two samples for the aluminum, the platinum and aluminum. Um, what is actually the main difference between them? What about the um, surface area particle size or then, you know, like the way of forming the platinum and the aluminum? Does that make a major difference? Um, well, there were two aluminum runs. That, that was the same practice run for two hours or four hours. Okay. Um, we haven't looked at different preparation methods for the practice, and we have characterized the dispersion, etc. And uh, that was kind of the adequate. Okay. So we haven't, uh, we haven't looked at practice preparation in very detail. Okay. Well, would you please help me thank uh, Mark again if there are no more questions?